just a while. <laughs> just to start us off, John, I believe you tri- attribute your time in boarding school in New Zealand as being an important factor in, in drawing you to music. Yeah, well, what else can you do when you're stuck in Christchurch in New Zealand? Your family and everyone live in Auckland or in Dunedin, so you've got nothing else to do except amuse yourself with what's around the school and fortunately the school had lots of music do you think the, the music bug would have caught you eventually anyway yes yeah i started piano when i was four and a half uh-huh. and uh because uh, mum said you want to learn the piano i said yep so i went went learnt had these two little old ladies who taught me piano in this little sort of castle type building and uh I sang in the choir at, at school as well, so I like I could hold a part up against my my brothers and sisters because we all used to sing rounds mm-hmm. while we were doing the dishes. And the first thing you had to do was learn to hold your part against everyone else. And so I I could sing harmony when I by the time I was six or seven years old. So at what point did uh, you start looking at at music as a as a career opportunity? Um, well, after I left school, I went to university and did the what they call the medical intermediate, which is the um, the exam you got to pass to get into medical school. And um, the first thing I got involved in was that was the what they have the ca- the capping concert, and they have a th- uh, they had a group called the Sextet, which was six, which was a six part male vocal group who were one of the main features of the capping concert we used to come out in the first half in clown suits uh, in the university colors and sing parody songs about the university the lecturers uh, politics government all that sort of stuff and then uh, in the second half of the concert we'd come out in full you know white and tails and and do serious six-part uh, a cappella harmony. So I, I got into the sextet in my first year at university. I, I gather that was the first, I was the first first year ever to make it into the sextet. Okay. And so I spent two years at university failing my exams and doing well in music. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I moved into television. And I, I used to hang a, I I shared a flat with, there was an Australian band called the Defenders who, who were the local band in Dunedin where I was living. And uh, Ray, the bass player, uh, came and shared the flat with me. And uh, so I, I got to know the guys very well. And then one day they came to me and said, look, we're, we're leaving, we're going, to, we're, we've had Dunedin, we're going back to Australia because they, they actually originally came from Toowoomba. And I said, oh, I'm going to miss you guys. And they said, well, why don't you come with us? And I said, what do you mean? They said, go and get yourself a keyboard and come and play keyboard in the band. So I said, okay. So I wanted to get a keyboard, but I wanted to get a Vox Continental. And that uh, I had to import one from England to get it. So I had to wait around for about eight weeks for it to be shipped over from England. So I spent time in Auckland. The boys went on t- t- to Sydney. And after, after, after the organ arrived, um, I got an org- my organ and my amp. I actually worked for Janssen uh, Music Instruments at the time because I got a, I got a job building their organs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then, then I arrived in Sydney in May of 1966, and uh, drove in. Th- we I sailed in through the heads on a boat on a ship most amazing experience if you've ever if you've ever done it yeah and uh the band had already had a gig at a, at a club in on the beach front at bondi we used to play start turn up at seven o'clock at feed us and then we'd play till three o'clock in the morning and so i ended up playing with with the band and we actually went and did a recording session at festival mm. And uh, we were known as uh, Chapter Three by then, I think. And um, 
I watched these guys recording. I'd, I'd, I'd seen recording going on in New Zealand when I was working in television. Because mm-hmm. um, um, we did musical recordings for, you know, we did a ser- TV series called Songs from the Shows, which were, which were shows, which were, you know, musicals, white horse in and all that sort of stuff. And I used to go and watch the recording of that. So I'd seen recording happening there. And then, then when I landed up in Sydney at festival, um, you know, we put the bed, bed track, the band track down. And then once that was done, they played that back to us and we sang all the harmonies and the vocals all in one go. And uh, I thought, maybe I could do this. Because eventually the band broke up because the boys said, we want to go back to, to, to Woomba. And uh, so they all went back to Toowoomba and I was left in Sydney and I I had another, I joined another band with Craig Collins, uh, which we called The Knack. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that, that spelt the same way and everything, but anyway. Um, and and then that, that band wasn't doing too well and I thought, maybe I could do this recording thing. So I picked up the... the uh, the telephone book in the yellow pages and looked up recording studios in the yellow pages and I came across this the biggest ad was for a company called Natec and uh, they are in Bly Street so I jumped on the bus from Bondi and, dro- and went into Bly Street and went up to the fourth floor or something third floor I think where the studio was and walked in and said uh, will you trained me to be a recording engineer and uh, I was ushered into this office with this old bloke and he said how old are you and I said I'm 21 he said well we've just fired our fifth 17 year old they all want to get in the music business but none of them want to do any work and I said oh yeah and he said well if you're prepared to work for a 17 year old's wage you can have a job <laughs> And I said, okay. So I landed up at the in the room at the back, filing all the tapes. And it was a it was a recording studio that recorded all the all the major commercials at the time. Um, and it also recorded all the music for band bandstand. Oh right. Remember the yeah, bandstand? So yeah. on every I think it was every Thursday, uh, I'd go and set up all the microphones for. Bob Young and 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 all his all the all these pro- professional musicians, you know, George Goller and you know those sort of guys, Bob Don Burrows and that. And uh, I'd set up all the mics for them to record, and a and a guy called Max Alexander would come over from Channel Nine, and he was the engineer who would record it all. And in in the four hour session in the morning from uh, the, from nine till one. Uh, they'd record all the backing tracks for all the people to sing on bandstand. All in one hit. There was six strings, five saxes, um, two, three trumpets, two trombones, uh, a full Johnny Sangster there with a full percussion set up of timpanis and xylophone and all that sort of stuff. A bass player with electric bass and acoustic bass, drummer, Two and two guitarists, and all in one hit. That the, the charts would come out. They'd all look through the chart. Bob, Bob Brown would say, oh, uh, Bob, "Bob Young, I mean the conductor would say, oh, this is the tempo, gentlemen,' and he'd tap his tempo in a way that, and they'd record it. Bang! Mm. These guys could read flash it, you know, just sight read everything, and. Uh, then, you know, as well as doing bandstand, we used to record uh, big sessions like that for uh, Peter Stuyvesant and all the cigarette companies in those days, and the airlines and all that sort of stuff. So I got myself a job as a an assistant engineer at, at Natec and spent and learnt from Alan Black was and War, uh, Laurie Wilmore were the two. Uh, engineers. Laurie Lor- did all the music and Alan did all the um, commercials, voiceover stuff. 
He was a he was a brilliant uh, tape editor and all that sort of stuff. And then on, on the Tuesday night, Max Max Alexander would come in, and he'd play all the band tracks, <laughs> and the singers would come in one by one and sing uh, the songs. And uh, he'd mix them, you know, mix the two together. He had two knobs. One had the band track, one had the vocal, and that was it. And that went down onto tape, and then they that was they they were played for that week's um, edition of Bandstand. Wow! And uh, when I was at one stage, uh, I'd been there for about six months, and I was starting to get the ropes. I was starting to understand how to, you know, how it all worked and all that sort of stuff. I could patch up the studio and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I got a call from uh, the boss saying. Uh, Max can't make it tonight to do the bandstand vocals, and um, Maury can't do it because he's sick, and Alan can't do it because he's in Melbourne. <laughs> uh, and so you're on, John. You're going to have to do it. So that night I got to record Dusty Springfield. Woo hey, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. yeah. She she came in and uh, I recorded Dusty Springfield. She was amazing, you know. She just went out in the studio and just went bang, you know. Real Fantastic. consummate performer. She only took one take. Now, but, when you, uh, you uh, came down to Melbourne and started working at Armstrong's, you found yourself under the, the tutelage of uh, Roger Savage. That must have been a, a great learning experience as well. It was, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, want, I, want, <clears throat> I, I landed up working at a studio in North Sydney called Eric P Porter's Film Productions which was a film studio with a music studio. And um, they used to make all the Mr. Sheen ads and all those sort of things, Louis the Fly and all that. And um, I had two friends who were both in advertising. And they came to me one day and said, John, we're going to Melbourne. I said, really? And they said, yeah, we got, this, we got a job in an advertising agency in Melbourne. Why didn't you come to Melbourne? And I said, why would it? Why would I want to go to Melbourne? And they said, well, why don't you go and get a job at Armstrong's? I said, oh, yeah, sure, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Ring up Armstrong's, get a job, you know. And one of the guys picked up the phone and bloody well rang Armstrong's and handed the phone to me and said, go on, ask for a job. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, this girl said, hello, Bill Armstrong Studios. I said, oh, uh, I was wondering if I could speak to Mr. Armstrong, please. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Bill's in Sydney. He's up uh, interviewing people for a job. Mm. I said, oh. <laughs> well, I was ringing to see whether or not he had a job. And they said, what's your name? And I said, told them who my name, who I was, and told them where I was. And I hung up. And about an hour later, the phone rang, and it was Bill Armstrong saying, Bill, uh, it's Bill Armstrong, John, I was wondering if you'd like to come and have lunch. Mm -hmm. So I went and had lunch with Bill, and uh, he said, uh, this was sort of, must have been near the end of the week because he said, no, I'll, I'll, I'll fly you down to, to Melbourne and you can see the studio and meet the staff. So I flew down to Melbourne that weekend and I met Roger Savage and Johnny Hawker and all the, all the crew that were involved in Armstrong's at the time. Alan Pay was the other engineer. And uh, I said, yeah, I'll take the job. So I moved to Melbourne and started at Armstrong's and that was just... That was fantastic because Roger was the, in my opinion, the best engineer in the country, and he still is. Yeah. You know. do, you, do you remember the first major hit song you worked on? Yeah. Um, where is it? Well, at the time, what was happening in those days was that we would have uh, what they call a, a bed track session, which where you. The, the, the team would come in, which was uh, Graham Morgan on bass, uh, on drums, Bob Arrowsmith on bass, either uh, John Farrer or Billy Green on guitar, and Peter Jones or what was the other guy that became a newsreader? Um, a film critic, I mean. No, anyway, on, on piano. And, we, and they'd put down the bed tracks. Some of them might be for Fable Records, which is Ron Tudor. Mm. Some of them might... And he, would, he would share a session with EMI, so 
we'd put down four bed tracks, two of them would be for EMI, two of them would be for Fable, do you know what I mean? Yep, yep. And then then, then the next night you'd have a, another session where you went in and did the vocals on them. And then you, or you might have, they might, because in the morning would be the the bed the bed tracks the uh, rhythm section then the brass section would come in and put brass on them and then the strings would come in and play strings on them and the vocal groups would come in and sing the harmonies on them and then the, then the following night the, the artists would come in and sing on top and so some you know like Ross D. Wiley's Here Comes the Star and um, a lot of the fable stuff with uh, uh, where is it all? I've got it all on my site. The, the names. Uh, Liv Mason. Right. And Matt Flinders. Do you know? Mm hmm. Uh, that, that, they'd come in and, and I'd land up. Sometimes, sometimes I'd be involved at, at the start doing the rhythm tracks and not do the end, or the other time I'd be involved at the end and not having not done the rhythm tracks and I suppose so I suppose the, the first big hit that I had that I which Roger recorded and um, Alan Pay did the brass and things like that and I got to do the vocal and mix it and that was Johnny Farnham's one okay yep yeah, yeah. and then uh, for uh, on my own as an engineer doing the whole lot that's the bass, you know, recording all the, the band, mixing it all, doing the vocals, the whole lot. The first major hit I would have recorded was Western Union Man for Max Merritt and the Meteors. Ah, fantastic. Record that still stands up uh, today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, after that I did uh, John Williamson's Old Man Emu because Roger had recorded all the bed tracks for that. It was part of a package deal uh, for Ron Tudor for Fable Records, and I was I was given the job of doing the vocal um, and the Jaws harp. I'd never recorded a Jaws harp before. That yeah. thing, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I got to do that and mix it. So I, Old Man Emu was one of my first records like that too which i had done do you have a most memorable recording session from that period oh there were lots of them there yeah. was some um, there was an most amazing time in that little little house at 100 albert road yeah it's now a high-rise building but bill had a series of of terrace houses and the 100 albert road was was the, was the studio but 104 albert road was was another terrace house which had Bill's office in it, had um, the voiceover recording studio, um, and tape dubbing rooms and things like that. And then we got another terrace house at the back of the place on another street, and that became another studio uh, for doing commercials. But all the major sessions were were, were done in, a, in in the main studio at 100 Albert Road, with a 10 by 10 control room. Oh God! Uh, you know, it was, it was an Optronics console. Yeah. But Armstrong's just had such a great team of people. There was Johnny Hawker and um, Peter Jones and uh, Jeff Hales and these are, are Rangers. Johnny Farrer. I can remember when Johnny Farrer came into the studio one day and said, guys, you're not going to believe this, but I got a telephone call last night from Hank Marvin from The Shadows mm. asking me if I'd go over and play guitar for The Shadows. And off he went. Off he went, yeah. <laughs> and met up, because his, uh, his girlfriend at the time was Olivia Newton-John's partner. That's right. The the the, well, the the two of them, the two girls, yeah, were a duo Harry. act. Yep. And um, that's how. And then Johnny Farrell ended up doing working with Bruce Welsh, recording by the banks of the old Ohio with for Olivia Newton John. And did, away they went. 
Did you find yourself after time finding that you had a good ear for, for which recordings that you were working on would become hits or, or not? Could you could you pick a hit? Yeah, I think I could. Yeah. I think I could. I worked with some, you know, the, you know there was there was a huge interplay that went on between the radio stations, the record companies and the studios. In those days, the record companies tended to do what, you know, take our advice. Mm-hmm. You know, I yeah. remember with with Ron Tudor, I'd recorded uh, "Show Me the Way" for Brian Cad, um, and I'd recorded him in Axiom as well with Arkansas Grass. You know, mm-hmm. and when we when we went and did his uh, Ginger Man album, which was what nineteen seventy two, we did that. Um, Ron Tudor sort of said, you know, sh- sh- should we do an album with this guy or not? You know, so we had a lot of we had a lot of input into whether or not people actually got to be recorded or not. Because mm-hmm. you know, the the opinions were all shared around a lot. But um, and the, the Ginger Man album was the first album ever done with Lockout. See, we used to prior to that all the. As I said, you know, the sessions were, were, were you know, a, a book session. You'd go and do all the rhythm tracks, then all it was all stripped down, and and the brass would come in, and it was all stripped down, and the gear was constantly set up and stripped down. And then, so, if you wanted to do an album and you wanted it to be consistent all the way through in terms of its sound, uh, the the new technique was called lockout, where you actually booked the studio and you had that access to that studio twenty four hours a day for a week. Okay. No one else was allowed in. So we set up on Monday. We set up all the drums, set up all the isolation of the piano, and there was just piano, bass, and drums. And we sat. We had that studio for a week to do all the bed tracks for the Ginger Man album. And that was the first time it was ever done in Australia. No, no one had ever done a full lockout session like that. Not even in Sydney studios. Mm. To, to the other end of the scale, are there any recordings that spring to mind that you you were sure would be major hits, successful, but they just never came to fruition? Oh yes, Mark Gillespie should have been a hit. Yeah, yeah. That was the most underrated. Out. It was a beautiful album. Um, it's funny. I was just talking to Gary Deutscher the other day. It was Gary and I who 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 started it off. We, Gary and I, he put in the studio and I put in my own put in my time to record that album. And, and Gary paid for the musicians to come up from Melbourne to play on it. Ross Ross Hannaford and and Joe Creighton uh, and Mark Meyer on drums. Mm. And we sold the album to Glenn Wheatley. And the day that Glenn released the album, Mark Gillespie went to India. <laughs> Not a good career move. <laughs> that's, that's the most ridiculous career move. Yeah, yeah. He he didn't he didn't like any publicity. He didn't want to do radio yeah. interviews. He didn't want to do anything. You know. Yeah. <laughs> But anyone who's got that album loves it. I, 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 I see that Astic, Astic Gil Matthews is going to release it. It's coming out, yeah, soon, which is good because yeah. my copy is just about worn out. <laughs> oh, you've got a copy. I've of got it, a copy. You? Yeah, yeah. I've actually met Mark. He's been on my show. All right. <laughs> Amazingly enough, I'd, I don't know what he's doing now though. Have you heard what he's up to? Well, I the last I heard was that he'd gone back to Bangladesh because he's a trained architect. Is he? Yeah. Oh. And I gather he's he's um, he'd been involved in designing buildings for uh, orphanages in Bang- Bangladesh. Mm. Great talent, but he just obviously never wanted to play the rock star game. No, he never no, did. No. no. You went over to a TCS Studios, uh, situated at Channel Nine, and how was that time? Were you having to work around hours where the studios weren't being used for for television? We had, yeah, well, we, the studio was set up by Colin Stevenson, who was the head of audio at Channel 9 at the time. 
and John French and I were employed to be the engineers. And we, you know, we established the studio. We had to get all the gear in and all that sort of stuff. And half of our job was to record band tracks for uh, in Melbourne tonight. Because at that stage, at one stage we were doing four. They were doing four in Melbourne tonight a week. Wow. Because Ugly Dave Gray had one. Jimmy Hannon had one. Um, Mike Walsh had one. Mm-hmm. And Graham Kennedy had one. So you know, there was a lot of uh, recording done for the, for them. And in between that, then we yeah we did we did rock and roll records. Mm. And, some, and some classic records too in that time. Yes, they were. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Metal Lake was one of the first ones, which John did for Michael Kadinsky. And it was what that was Kadinsky's first major record came out from there that's right I remember doing um, Russell Morris Sweet Sweet Love and all those uh, tracks came out of that out of that out of those sessions um, Chain yes Lords of Blues we did that and Wendy Saddington looking through a window did an album for there Max Mirror did, did the Stray Cats album, which was awful. <laughs> <laughs> and I did Lobby Lloyd and Coloured Balls, Ball Power. The Ball Power album, yeah. 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 And Mackenzie Theory, Out of the Blue, which I gather is going to be released also from... Uh, it's on the list, I believe, yeah. Yes, it's on the list. Which is fantastic. And uh, Matt Taylor, Straight as a Die album, I did that as well. Um... Because uh, did you have you seen? I don't know if you've seen the Fraternity Seasons of Change track on YouTube. I have actually, yeah, yeah. With Bon Scott playing flute. With bon Scott on, yeah, yeah, I have seen that. <laughs> <laughs> that was done there too. No, that was done in that was done in Albert Road. Oh, okay. oh yes, yep. Yeah, that's that's one of the very early recordings, in that because Armstrong's moved to. Um, Bank Street in about 1971 I think mm-hmm. somewhere around about 70, 71, 72 somewhere around about there because I know uh, the Ginger Man album was done in uh, end of 71, beginning of 72 and that was one of the first albums we did in the new studio over at Bank Street I, I, I went back to Channel back to Armstrong's from TCS that's right. Yeah. And did that album. And I spent some time at, at Armstrong's and then eventually moved to Sydney in 74. So was there a particular enticement to, to get you back up to Sydney? Yeah, well, I, I applied for a job as a producer at Festival. Uh-huh. They wanted me to go up there because they were putting in a brand new Neve console and they're up you know upgrading their studio so i went there and i hung around for about four months waiting for them to get the studio up and going and they still hadn't done it after about six months of working for them i i I did one recording the whole time and that was uh oh no i did two i did uh, jimmy little's baby blue Mm mm-hmm uh, which got his career back up and going again, and um, and I did Chain. Uh, what was it called? Uh, I'm going to miss you, babe. Oh yes, yep, yep. That that was recorded. That was also recorded in Festor. But I got sick and tired of waiting around for them to, you know, pussyfoot around trying to get this console go up and going. And it, you know, it was very public service type. <laughs> you know, the way the record company ran and everything like that. Yeah. And I ran it to Charlie Fisher and he said, come and join us at, and set up Trafalgar. So I went and joined with Charlie and we went and set up Trafalgar, Trafalgar Studios in Sydney. And we within you know four years, we were the, one of the number one studios in Australia with that. 
it was a very successful period for you. You picked up yeah. awards and all sorts of recognition. How important do you rate that that type of industry recognition? Oh, it's, you know, I, I, I never, I never even, I got an aria and didn't even go and pick it up. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about uh, setting up the music farm complex. Was there a particular studio complex elsewhere in the world that inspired the the whole dream of the music farm studios? Yeah, well, it, it was in 1974. I went to America. And I studied studio design over there for, I spent about three or four weeks, three, four weeks with a guy called Dean Jensen, who was the number one techo in, in, in America, at the, in Los Angeles. He was the guy who was responsible for setting up all the major studios, the record plant, you know, the, uh, and Motown and uh, A&M, all these studios. He, he was the techo who set up all this, this their gear. And we we went out to Kendon, which was the latest studio to be built in America, uh, out in Burbank. And we spent two a whole weekend out there. And I got to study and work out how the acoustics were all worked out and how the, the place was built and how the isolation was achieved and all that sort of stuff. And so... Music Farm was was my first, you know, major building a studio from the ground up, um, and 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 there was, and the whole concept of a of a country studio where you you turn up and um, stay with accommodation and everything like that was no one, no one had ever done that before. No, and it was the first studio like that. Um, consequently, lots of bands came up and, and spent time at Music Farm and it was one of the reasons why Byron Bay became such a popular place because uh, people would go into Byron Bay and say hey I just was I was in Byron Bay and James Rain and all the guys from Australian Crawl were there you know mm. and so a lot of pop stars were seen in Byron Bay and consequently Byron Bay became a, a pop star type place now you found yourself uh, back in television again at Channel Seven, and suddenly there was the the, the visual element to, to work with as well. Was that a a tricky transition for you? Yes, it was. I got the fright of my life when I took on that job, <laughs> <laughs> um, because I, I realised that I had no no experience of relating picture and sound together. But for, fortunately, uh, Weston Baker, who was the head of Channel Seven. Because when when I, I was approached because they wanted an audio director for Beyond Two Thousand who had rock and roll experience, mm -hmm. and Murray Burns and Colin Bailey were the two guys who were going to do all the music, and Murray and I were old mates because we I'd done two My Six albums with him, and so I got the gig of, but Weston Baker said to me, "Look, come and." Come and work at Channel Seven and 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 do the do the do everything, do the news, you know. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, I think the first time I did the news on Channel Seven it was probably the most scary engineering job I ever did in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> because it was it really was it's really full on frightening, you know. Yeah. By the time I. After six months of doing it, I, I could do it standing on my head. But when you first when you first do it, it was really hard. Yeah. <clears throat> and the, and the first my first attempts at, at mixing Beyond Two Thousand were pretty dramatic, drastic too. But fortunately, John Luscombe, who was the producer, of the uh, the director of the show, uh, supported me and and held my hand all the way through. And um, in the end, I landed up mixing about three hundred and eighty. Uh, episodes of Beyond 2000 and we built the uh, Tarman facility which was a mixed down studio and track laying and all that sort of stuff and edit suites to so Beyond could actually was totally self-contained and can use its own facilities without actually going out and hiring external facilities mm -hmm. and because the, the um, and that those studios at Beyond 2000 were 
one stage we were doing four television one hour television shows a week which is a, a lot of it's, um, it's a lot of work a, it's a lot of work yeah, yeah. i was I, I burnt myself out through the end of that period <laughs> Uh, it was just, just you know. Sometimes I'd start beyond mixing beyond at nine o'clock in the morning and finish at three o'clock the next day. And after all that, you found yourself in Wagga Wagga of all places. Yes, doing some work. Well, my my wife dragged me there. <laughs> <laughs> get get me away from Sydney and all the hype and all the, you know, and uh, put on put on the academic mode. That was. It's really not my style, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's very similar to the thing I went through with festival. I couldn't, you know, festival records and, 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 and universities were very, very similar. <laughs> In recent times, you've been offering your services as a studio designer. Is there a common thread that you're always striving to, to achieve in every, every studio you design? Um... Yeah, I'm trying. I'm, I've been playing playing with different acoustic spaces, and it's um, the, the most amazing one which we've just completed is 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 Sparky's Container Studio. Yeah, well, I saw that on your website, and uh, like he's getting some beautiful sound out of that studio. Acoustically, it's working. It, it works really well. He loves the studio, <laughs> and uh, we're now going to build a, a, a second control room. Um, and that's all out of just a stock standard shipping container. That's right. It's amazing. Because he's a renter, ah. and he said, "John, I'm sick of getting my studio set up and having to move." So it's now sitting in his in his in his next to his house that he's renting, and if he has to move, he just gets a truck and drags it in and sticks the studio on the back of the truck and takes it to the next place. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> And he's getting lots of work. You yeah. know? Uh, he, lots of the people people love the work, that the, the sound he's getting out of the facility, and uh, so yeah, so he's, he's he's having great success with that. Fantastic. But uh, the, the studio I did in Dubai was an interesting studio because that that was you know I, I was that's what I what I call my first Muslim studio. You know? <laughs> But unfortunately, that has been it's been te torn down at this moment as I speak. Oh, shame! Because Dubai just coll collapsed after Majid got the studio up and going. All his clients folded. Mm. And there's there's one. Someone told me that they found three thousand cars parked at Dubai International Airport with the keys still in them. You're kidding. Yeah. People just fleeing. People just fled, yeah. yeah. Good God. And so, all the cars were leased, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so they just, you know. So poor old Majid's had to tear the whole thing down. He's trying to keep it. He's got a uh, a builder who's trying, who's, who's, you know, said he'll try and keep as much of it as he can so maybe put it back together again later but yeah no it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a shame because you get personally involved with all the clients but you talk to them every day like I'm talking to you now you know because uh, of because of Skype mm -hmm. and so uh, you know, I, I, chat, I, usually, I used to I was chatting with Majid practically every morning when he was going to bed at night and I was getting up in the morning, you know, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm an early riser and he was a late night sleeper. So, uh, we, used to, we, had, we had lots and lots of conversations and to see him go through this is very hard, you know, because we experienced the birth of his young daughter and all sorts of things went through that time. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, it's, uh, John, for example, in Massachusetts with his studio Meow Mix, which is a beautiful studio, but he still hasn't finished it because <laughs> he can't afford it. You know, it, it, they're expensive things to build, and they take a lot of time. Yeah. So, what about uh, up, upcoming work for yourself? John? Are you doing any production at all? Um, I've just completed an album for a friend of mine, Dave Kavanagh. 
Mm -hmm. um, Dave and I have been mates for a long time. For the last, oh, you know, 14, 15 years, we've been you know, close mates, and we we play music together. I, you know, we go to parties, and I play keyboards, and he plays guitar, and and I know all his songs and and all that sort of stuff. And he, uh, so he he just recorded a, an out. Al- an album with uh, Geordie from bass player from Rose Tattoo. Oh yeah, he lives just Geordie lives just down the road from Dave, and he's got a a setup under his house where he's got a control room and a, and, a, and a space to record in. And um, so Dave and Dave and gets uh, there's a uh, the drummer and and bass player all go into Geordie's studio and they put down the the songs and do the harmonies and do the overdubs and everything and then they burn it onto a DVD and send it to me and I I mix it and straighten it all out and uh, I get him I get Dave to do it do at least five vocals and I I then cut the best vocal for the song out of that do you know what I mean mm-hmm. and uh, yeah so he's just released that album um, there's one of there was a song a song on on the on the album that they he got a notification one email morning saying that the people who were promoting the Save the Kimberley had uh, were using his song on their site to promote their to promote Saving the Kimberley and he had an, he had another song which was very successful in a um, a surfing movie okay and uh, <laughs> he said one day he was he played that he played it at, at one of the gigs he plays in cool and yeah and a guy came up to him after and said mate your cover of that song from the so-and-so surfing movie was really good <laughs> <laughs> They said I didn't cover it. I rec- recorded it. <laughs> oh, hey, John, great to catch up with you. It's like talking to a walking, uh, living history of Australian music. I could sit and listen to you for hours. Talk about <laughs> all the fantastic thanks, uh, sessions you've been involved with over the years. And uh, thanks for your time today. Much appreciated. My pleasure, mate. Okay, take care. Okay. Bye bye. Wait, what, what radio station is this going to land up?